Peter. Now, you're going to tell us. I'm sure you've got such a lot of interesting uh, background to tell us of your life. And in the short time that you've been in Northwood, uh, you and Bobby have made yourself known to so many of us. And we know that you have a very uh, long and interesting background to, uh, to, to tell us about. So perhaps you'd like to start and tell us, as a beginning, where you were born and a little bit about your parents. I was born in Amherst Road in 1915, in the second year of the war. Uh, my parents were Samuel Lipton and Sarah Lipton. Just before I was born, my father decided to change his name from Lipschitz to Lipton because he was teaching at the beginning of the war and people, the children were making awful fun of him, Lipschitz, and pretending he was German and he thought he wouldn't inflict this on his daughter. So by deed poll, he changed his name to Lipton and I was born Lipton. He was born in Vilna, the son of Jacob Lipschitz, who was this antiquarian Jewish bookseller, who from Vilna traveled to Fairs, Salonika, looking for rare Hebrew manuscripts, many of which are now in the British Museum, or in the Rosenbach collection in America, or the Adler collection, and he's a subject I could dwell on for a long time. Unfortunately, I don't know enough about him. But my whole of my childhood in Amherst Road was associated with Zionism because my father set up the Karen Hayasod in England uh, and he, this was after the war, during the war he was secretary to the chief rabbi, one of his jobs, registrar of marriages, but after the war became very involved in work for the war victims in Europe, headed large campaigns to try and uh, bring relief and resettlement and then switched to Zionist work, and he accompanied Dr. Weizmann, Sokolov, on their tours. He organized the London Conference, at the London Opera House, in 1918, the year to, after the Balfour Declaration, when the Weizmann had gone out with the Zionist Commission to Palestine. And uh, recently, in the pillars of the program done by Eban, Pillars of Fire on Channel 4, I saw this photograph of my father, who died in 1935, up on the screen, with Dr. Weizmann and Sokolov and the others who'd come back with their report from post. So it wasn't difficult for me to become a young Zionist. And in 1927, the year my brother was born, we moved from the very Jewish, uh, very friendly Amherst Road uh, to Hendon. I had been at school in Sigden Road, a primary school, where when my father took me to school, the headmistress said to me, if I were you, I wouldn't bring your daughter to this school. And he said, why not? She said, there are too many Jewish children here. And he said, that's precisely why I've brought her. But I was very happy at Sigden Road. And for a year, I went on to the Dalston Secondary School, Birkbeck, near Ridley Road, Colston Crescent. I went to Hebrew classes in Shekawa Lane, shul classes, and I had private Hebrew lessons every lunchtime from a Mr. Rom. Unfortunately, it didn't make a lasting impact. Uh, so I worked hard at my Hebrew without many results. But when we moved to Hendon in 1927, I couldn't get into a local school. It was in the middle, and my, my father tried one or two, and they were all full up. So off I went to the city to school. He was working by then, Rafael Tucks, um, Dick Cohen's family. And he was going from Golders Green on the tube to Moorgate. And he said, why don't you accompany me then? You can go to the City of London College, which I did. And I did my trick at City of London College and then finished my formal education and went to work at Rafael Tucks. But as soon as I left school at 16, I started to do something in the Zionist work on my own. And I joined a young Zionist society in this new neighborhood of ours called Halapid. And Halapid was associated with, was a part of the Association of Zionist Youth Group, the AYZS, and they met at Dunstan Road Synagogue. And I became very active in this AYZS with a local society, Halapid. I remember very well the first time I ever debated in public 
the motion was there will be no future for the Jewish people in the diaspora once the Jewish national home is established in Palestine. And the speaker for the motion was one Victor Mishkin. The seconder of the motion was one called Aubrey Ebert. They both came from Hayatid, the Young Zionist Society of Brixton. The other side was put by Ab Kramer, the chairman, and I was asked to second it. My father had written my speech for me, and so terrified was I that even in reading this speech, I lost my way in the middle of a sentence, and it was a disaster. And I vowed then that I'd never speak in public again unless I knew my subject. It took me a while to master the history of Zionism and what it was all about, and then I was promoted to serving on the executive of the Association of Young Zionist Societies. And when the Association of Young Zionist Society uh, merged with the University Zionist Federation in 1935, I became the first honorary secretary of the newly formed Federation of Zionist Youth. I had a lovely time visiting provincial communities, speaking about Zionism, and especially good time at Young Zionist summer schools held in Wales, in Lancashire, and speaking uh, to groups there and making new friends from all over the country. These were lovely days until my father died at the very early age of 44 in 1935. And my world was changed from then on. My mother, as a young widow, had come from Russia, from somewhere near Minsk. She had lost her mother in childhood and she came at the age of 12 to her aunts in Old Golson Street in the East End. They found her a bed at the back of their post office and she helped with the housework and she went out to work as a milliner trainee. She was very grateful to her aunt and family who had lots of children herself for bringing her over from Russia, steerage class, and for her allowing her to live with the family, which she did until she got married. She told me, my mother, Sarah, that she had made hats for Queen Victoria's wedding, and she was very uh, proud of this. No, sorry, that's wrong, Queen Victoria's funeral. She was very proud of this black hats she'd made at the time. Well, she always lived in the East End until she married, uh, they married in 1914 at um, Mazikadash Synagogue in the East End and it was very hard for my father to find a bride. Now, he was a good looking man, a fair man, fair, uh, and he had had a good education because his father, as I said, having come from Vilna, uh, was an educated man in Hebrew matters and he was determined his son should be. So my father had gone to Jews College and University College. And it was, he was really destined for the ministry, but he changed his mind. He was a lifelong vegetarian. And this is why it was hard for him to get a shidduch. Because who was going to marry a vegetarian? So eventually, through a, a shotgun, a, a marriage broker, he was introduced to my mother, and it worked very well. But she vowed that her children would never be vegetarian. So she cooked separately for my father, who didn't mind us having meat or chicken in the house, but fish he couldn't stand because of the smell. So we were always different from other families. We didn't have cold fried fish around and those sort of meals. Um, it was a blow in every sort of way when my father died because I was then responsible for helping my mother to deal with the family estate we lived in a big new house in Shahul Lane, Hendon. My mother had no trade. She couldn't go out to work because my sister was only 12 uh, and my brother was only seven. For a year, 11 months rather, my brother was taken to Raleigh Close Synagogue to say Kaddish for the whole period of mourning. And this made a great impact on all the family. But I became head of the family and I had to negotiate, 
pension rights from my mother. I had to look at Rayford Tucks, that the commissions coming in from my father's sales uh, were properly credited to family. And suddenly I was taking responsibility for investments. I remember going to see Mr. Otto Schiff, my father had known from his refugee work, who was a stockbroker to say, how shall we invest our money, our little money? And uh, these were responsibilities uh, that didn't, although I took them on, it didn't deter me living my active social Zionist life as well as working during the day. While I was still at Rayford Tucks, I thought how could I continue my father's work. He was doing publicity, advertising, setting up a whole new department for Rayford Tucks. And um, I went to see uh, Mr. Seif, Israel Seif of Marks and Spencer. I knew my father was very friendly with Simon Marks and Israel Seif to see how they could help me. I was rather silly because instead of asking for a job, Marks and Spencer, which would have been a nice opening, I asked for introductions to their suppliers. And Israel Seif sent me to Cora's, Margaret's of Leicester, I remember, and to see if I could get orders from them for pictorial, pictorial advertising. A woman on the road didn't do very well those days. And it seemed to me I wasn't bringing in the big orders I'd hoped for. And when I'd sorted things out at Marks and Spen at um, Rayford Tucks, I thought, really, I ought to move on. And Desmond Tuck was particularly nice to me. Um, and he said, well, if that's how you feel, I'll give you every encouragement. At the same time, I was active with the Jewish National Fund, and I think I was in charge of all the box collections for the gem boxes throughout London, the collectors. But something else had happened in the communal sphere. I had been elected to the Executive Council of the Zionist Federation. And whereas my father before had worked at Great Russell Street and in fact found the offices after Bedford Square, I, in my own right, was a member of this very imposing Zionist Federation Executive Council, and at that time um, the chairman of the council was um, J.K. Goldblum, and afterwards Professor Brodetsky, and I knew the Zionist leaders fairly well then. I remember Ben Gurion used to come to the meetings, he was living in Edgware, where his son was born, I became very friendly with um, Moshe Sharet, Shertok, afterwards the Foreign Minister of Israel. And in 1937, I was encouraged to apply for a scholarship called the Woman of Worth Scholarship, the Ashish Chayon Scholarship, which was to give me a hundred pounds to go to Palestine. To, the idea was to come back and, um, and uh, try and get other people to go on Aliyah, to talk to groups throughout the country. Well, I applied in 37 and had all sorts of recommendations, Professor Samson Wright, Professor Brodetsky, Beth Stansky, various people. And I was due to go out to speak at the opening designer centre in Glasgow. And just before I got the train, I bought a copy of the Jewish Chronicle and saw that the Glasgow girl had won this £100 scholarship to go to Palestine. When I arrived in Glasgow at the opening of the Zionist Centre, Professor Brodetsky, as the main speaker, referred to the fact that Glasgow had, had the honour of having the Asia Schiles scholar in its midst, a girl called Yetta Golombok, and he hoped the London candidate would be more successful the following year. And I could have fallen through the floor, as you can imagine. But the London candidate was more successful the following year, so successful that I was the last of the Asia Schiles scholars. I got the hundred pounds to go, and my mother, it was very sad that I was going to Palestine at the time of the disturbances. She went to see my father's friend, Diane Gollop, at the Hampstead Synagogue and said, my daughter ought to go to Palestine, it's too dangerous and I need her here. But I did go, he encouraged me to go and I went. And there I had a fascinating time staying at the kibbutz of Afki Kim, where the English Kalutzin were at the time, going to Jerusalem, uh, traveling on my own, but they did ask that I shouldn't travel on the buses. Charette in Jerusalem said it would be very dangerous for me to travel alone on the buses and if I was going to go to places, would I take a taxi or would I go with somebody, which I did. I found 
I think him fascinating and Karad, but I've never felt so British my whole life as I was in Palestine in the early days. Probably because Palestine was full either of the immigrants from Eastern Europe who had quite a different culture and the uh, more recent uh, German refugees who had no Zionist ideology but merely came to Palestine as a place of refuge. It was a very difficult time for me to become adjusted to the reality of the Jewish National Home with the idealism of Pinsker's auto emancipation that I'd studied in my early Zionist days or the works of Achad Ha'am. And I met in Palestine many young Zionists who had uh, settled and were finding life there very difficult but very rewarding. The impact of the watchtower of the Kibbutzim was very great. The first thing they built was a watchtower at Afi Kim, and uh, they were all having to take guard. But at the same time, there was visits. There were visits by the Arab neighbors, many of whom had good relations with the Jewish settlers. I remember the Tommies at the Wailing Wall giving me a cup of black coffee um, uh, Turkish coffee, they called it, uh, when they heard that I was from England. This was the first time I'd ever been out of my native country. And uh, when I came back to England, I had to speak all over the country uh, talking about my impressions of Palestine. It was difficult. I knew that I was supposed to make young people apply to settle in Palestine. And at the same time, for various reasons, I couldn't do that myself. The uh, centre of this scholarship was the, it was the Rose and Sunlight Scholarship from Manchester. I had to report back to Manchester to a big meeting there. I spoke at the uh, Free Trade Hall in Manchester. I remember speaking in Hull on one of these weekend tours and saying how different life was in Palestine for the Jews. Imagine there were Jewish dustmen. And I even made the terrible faux pas of saying, can you imagine there was Jewish, uh, there were Jewish Fishermen. Have you ever seen a Jewish fisherman? Well, of course, in Hull they had seen Jewish fishermen, mm -hmm. and there were Jewish fishermen in the audience. So, uh, there were embarrassing times. But I think my most useful work at that time was to organize a Zionist platform in Hyde Park and a series of open-air meetings at which I spoke, but I also enrolled many speakers. The purpose was to counteract the um, propaganda of the Arab platform which came into Hyde Park and was and the speakers there were mostly Arabs of the neighboring countries they were people called the Palestine Students Union and they were young Arabs often run rich young Arabs otherwise they couldn't have come to study in England who were really afraid that what was going on in the Jewish national home would make labor for their families more expensive and they were utterly opposed to the idea of the National Home. And we were showing how under the uh, Balfour Declaration we had been promised uh, immigration and how the mandate had confirmed this when it was given to Great Britain and how all of this had really uh, been dissipated, so much land given away by um, the British government in subsequent years, the moment, the moment there were troubles in Palestine itself. Um, I think the propaganda we did and, and the Arab propaganda we tried to counteract at that time was very valuable. We also lobbied members of parliament. I remember going to the House of Commons on many occasions. There were some very good uh, non-Jewish supporters. Um, there was Herbert Sidebottom who uh, published this Palestine um, which went to all members of the par of Parliament. This was really the forerunner of Wyndham Deeds and his work for um, Israel, the now Wyndham Deeds scholars. But there was a lot of non-Jewish interest. There was Wedgwood Ben. There was uh, uh, many, many, of course, Lord Balfour. And particularly, do I remember, Mrs. Blanche Dugdale, uh, Balfour's niece, who was often to be seen around with the historian Professor Namia. Uh, I used to see Dr. Weizmann from time to time. I saw Laurie, who was in charge of Great Russell Street, 
And I also walked away from the Zionist executive meetings along Great Russell Street to the um, Lions Corner House at Tottenham Court Road with Aubrey Eban, after he became Foreign Minister of Israel, who at that time was acting as personal assistant to Weizmann because Laurie was uh, not around, Jerry Linton. And we had uh, days of great hope then, but those were the days before the white paper and before the World War. Um, during the war, uh, things changed so much because whereas in the First World War, the Jews had fought on both sides. In this last war, there was only one side on which the Jews could fight. That was on the Allied side to defeat Hitler. And uh, it was stated that the first thing we had to do was to defeat Hitler. And afterwards, we would negotiate about what uh, would be the settlement, whether there would be a Jewish national home under the petition plan, how it worked out. But unfortunately, the reality was so heartbreaking. Just at the time when war was declared was the time we also knew uh, what was happening in Germany. We knew that there were thousands and thousands of people trying to get out of Germany. And we had the opportunity then of taking refugees if we were prepared to guarantee them. I always think that many opportunities were missed by the anglo jewish community. I think the Quakers behaved extremely well. Um, I have a sense of guilt that in my circle we weren't doing enough to um, house young refugees. Um, we didn't get the message strong enough. Maybe we were fighting too hard to get certificates. We wanted the mandatory power to increase the number of certificates. Um, and yes, that was necessary and they should have increased it, but when a few years later it was all clamped down and the, and the young people and the older people were marooned in Hitler's Europe, uh, a great sense of guilt enveloped me as to what more I could have done and my generation could have done. I myself had to give up my Zionist speaking and my Zionist activities when I entered the civil service in the beginning of 19, at the end of 1940, I think the beginning of 41, when I went to work at the Ministry of Aircraft Production, working on the aircraft program at uh, Millbank and going back uh, to uh, my mother's house in Shahul Lane, Hendon, which had been bombed. Uh, earlier in 1940 raids and my mother had gone for, for a while she'd had to go to live in Henley and my young brother came back only for his bar mitzvah which was a Hendon shawl and it was very difficult to get uh, tuition for the bar mitzvah and I remember we were sleeping on the floor of the house before his bar mitzvah took place in 1940 but my civil service career was a complete change from everything I'd done up to then, and I um, found it fascinating. My husband-to-be, to whom I was engaged in February 1941, uh, went into the Air Force as an AC-2, and by the time we married in March 42, he was a pilot officer, and we married knowing that he was going aboard one week later. And instead of it being an April wedding, it was put back to March 42. We were married at the Hendon Synagogue in Raleigh Close, and he sailed the following week for destination unknown. It was three months till I heard from him. And when I heard from him, I got a cable from India. So he had arrived, and then the following few days, I got cables from Durban, where he'd been en route. So, we had these little aerograph letters during the war. I continued to live at my mother's house until the end of April 40, until the end of um, 43. In the meantime, my young sister Jeanette had been married before I was. A great uh, shame in those days. How could I have not been married? And she was, she married very young, and her husband was also in the Air Force. But she came, her marriage wasn't very happy. She came back to live at my mother's house in Shahul Lane, and there was a young baby there. 
And to me, it was a great strain on my mother and on the household. And I thought, this is no good. I must get a place to live on our own when my husband came back. My husband, who was being then a member of the Wilsdon Council, it seemed right that I should find somewhere for us to live in his locality. So I took a flat in Bronsbury, and we lived in um, on the bridge in Bronsbury Park. I lived, rather. I took some friend to live with me until he came home in June 45. I had had a very interesting time after my stay at uh, MAP at Aircraft Production because my boss, Professor John Jukes, who was a um, great economist, uh, took me with him to work at the office of the Minister of Reconstruction on Lord Wilt Walton's staff, and I worked in Richmond Terrace on the white paper plans on the post-war reconstruction. Uh, towards the end of the war, I was suffering very much, I think, from um, being on my own and not getting news from my husband for quite a while. And I felt the need of a change of work, and I, in fact, went to work. I went to see them at uh, the Treasury, I remember, and I got a transfer to Air Ministry so I could be part of a team instead of working so much on my own in Whitehall. And uh, it was at Air Ministry where I got the telephone from my husband in June 45 to say, uh, is that Mrs. Levy? Yes. Are you sure it's Mrs. Levy? This is Mr. Levy. I said, don't be silly, there's a meeting going on here. He had come home, by then a wing commander, to plan the war against Japan. I hadn't realised he was coming home, and my immediate response was, sorry, it's the holiday, you know, and I haven't got any bread in the house. I'd better do something about that. So it was really a restart programme. He came home from overseas. I had to, we had to get used to living together, but within a few weeks, he was sent out to York, and again, I was left alone for about another nine months until he was demobbed. It was very difficult. I left the civil service with the sole aim of producing babies before it was too late and trying to settle down the married life. He, on the other hand, found it very difficult to um, accept responsibility for a, a wife who wanted a family when his legal practice was non-existent because obviously nobody carried on during the war or somebody tried to but it wasn't very productive and so we had to start a whole new life again and I stayed at home in those days it wasn't you didn't want to work until you were six months pregnant I just wanted to start I had great difficulty in producing children but eventually happily we were able to do this and in 1950 he left the Wilson Council and we moved to Mill Hill where we found a house Bobby said we could only afford it, but somehow we did, and where we brought up our young daughter Jacqueline Carmel, I'd named her Carmel because I was so impressed with the environment in Mount Carmel, and uh, there, after much difficulty, our second child, David, was born five years later. We were much involved with the setting up of the Mill Hill United Synagogue community, and my own public work was very, very slight at that time. I did become chairman of the local branch of the League of Jewish Women. I think it was the Bronsbury group in the 40s and uh, encouraged to, I was doing work in the general community. I, 1945, I remember fighting the election for my husband and uh, speaking at a meeting for the MP Elect, the MP was trying to win SS Hammersley, who became a great friend of Israel. And I was approached by, I think it was Lord Tynham, who said, won't you stand as a parliamentary candidate? We could do with you. And I said, yes, I want to have babies, but I'm more interested in that at the moment. And so um, it was a domestic life for the next few years. We reached the end, yes. We have I had my introduction to non-Jewish political life through my husband Bobby and his work on the Wilton Council. When he came back and he was on the council for a few years, um, this opened really a new world of interest to me. Uh, I did very little practical about it, but um, after some years of domesticity, um, I found very useful work 
in the Citizens Advice Bureau in Hampstead where I trained under Mary Marr and uh, we can, we, uh, this was the basis of a long and lasting friendship. Uh, she helped me understand people's problems and know how to cope with them and I was asked by the people at the headquarters of the Citizens Advice Bureau if I could start a bureau in Hendon. I remember going to see the mayor of Hendon at the time and he said we don't need a bureau here, we have very good information services and he gave me a glass of sherry and I got to know the mayor's parlour but it was not very productive. I continued my work in Hampstead at West End Lane. I was in charge of the Burke House Bureau and then went to open a new bureau at Swiss Cottage in near the theatre there. And I felt um, this was very uh, uh, worthwhile work and I was learning such a lot about the new legislation, particularly the housing legislation. Uh, meanwhile, my daughter was going off to university. My son had had a lot of illness and my daughter said, Mummy, when David goes back to school, he was at Haberdashers and he really had been very ill for about two years, having had a spinal operation and other things the matter. What are you going to do next? And uh, I thought about my lack of education and took her advice and decided to do um, a course at University College um, on international affairs. This broadened my horizon, taught me something about international law, international institutions, and I've never regretted that because what I really enjoyed at that period was mixing with the overseas students who were intending to join their diplomatic service. But in 1965, when the reorganisation of London government became effective, it was realised that in Hendon, now part of the borough of Barnet, they had no citizens' advice bureau, where in Barnet and Finchley and Fryan Barnet they did have. And this time, when I approached the chief executive town clerk of Hendon, of Barnet, now of Hendon, formerly of Hendon, now of Barnet, as to whether we couldn't set up a CAB, he said yes we might consider it, submit a budget. And I remember submitting a budget, going to find premises. He offered me premises, which I turned down. I set up a committee, which I became chairman for a short time, until I handed over to somebody called Clara Thubram, because I knew that we must have help from a councillor. It was no good trying to get on without the active cooperation. So the CAB eventually set up in 133 West Hendon Broadway, and I always felt that was my baby. Uh, I had also become involved and worked for the Imperial Cancer Research Fund and I started earlier a group of Mill Hill friends, the first friends of the Imperial Cancer Research in London. I remember organising the first flag day that the Imperial Cancer Research Fund ever had and I was responsible for the whole of North West London and we had flag sellers and um, people found I was quite a good fundraiser at that time and really I didn't enjoy fundraising but I seemed to do it quite well and um, it was satisfying to particularly to get away from the fundraising and collect samples of normal women's blood and urine so they could do research at the Mill Hill laboratories of the fund onto why uh, women, whether women's breast cancer had anything to do with their hormone content and to try and examine it. And this they did first in the Isle of, in, in our area, then in Guernsey, and now it's become a I'm pleased to say I'm a governor of the Imperial Cancer Research Fund and when I get the annual reports and see that this has become a preventative treatment for breast cancer, it's a practical thing in which I take pride that we managed to do something. Um, CAB occupied me quite a while and I was especially concerned with the housing problems of that period and the housing acts which were so disastrous. And I was approached to wouldn't I like to go on to the Greater London Council? And this was in 1970, uh, 1971, 72. Somebody had died suddenly in office, and there was going to be a proper election in 73, but in 72, two young people had asked for a by-election to be called, and would I stand as the Conservative candidate? 
I stood for this by-election for the whole of Barnet, which was 300,000 people. And uh, I won the by-election representing Barnet and went on to the Greater London Council, which was a very intimidating experience. I didn't really enjoy my time at County Hall. It was too complicated, too grandiose. I hated the bell ringing, and I didn't get to grips with my subject. I served on the Thamesmead Committee without ever, ever having been to Thamesmead. But the following April, there was the Bain election for the JLC. And fortunately, I think, I lost that election because uh, it meant that uh, the, the constituency worked much harder next time and also meant that this time I was fighting Hinder North instead of the whole of Barnet. By then the constituencies had been divided up. And I was then asked to go on to Barnet Council. Uh, I didn't have to travel so far and the issue was more on the globe. And I did enjoy being able to help people with their housing problems in a practical way. I think the office was very good, but in every sort of large organisation there are people with good uh, causes uh, good, who get overlooked in the system and need help and I think that uh, my experience at the CAB showed me how useful a councillor could be not only in deciding policy but also in writing the grievances of some people who have been missed by the system. So I was on Barney Council for a period of four years, but first from 74 to 78 and uh, at that time um, I was surprised at the end of that four years to be asked if I would stand for the mayoralty. Well, they hadn't had a woman mayor before, and I had never thought about this, and I knew that you had to be on for five years. However, uh, the leader of a council who approached me said that he thought by the time I'd been on the following year that would be all right, and he'd like to have me as the first woman mayor. And so I was elected mayor in 79 to 80, it was only one year, and soon after my election I had the privilege of bestowing the freedom of the Borough of Barnet on the newly elected Member of Parliament for the uh, constituency of Finchley in the Borough of Barnet. I remember spending the uh, election night with Mrs Thatcher, the election night of, of May uh, 79. And she was very anxious to get away from the Hendon Town Hall and Barnet Town Hall uh, to see whether that next morning she would become the Prime Minister, where the Conservatives won the majority. And I watched her and her daughter Carol and Dennis Thatcher through the night. But giving Mrs Thatcher the freedom of the borough the following February was really one of the highlights of my public service. It was a ceremonial occasion, and it was nice to note that she was human, nervous, and encouraging. She was uh, absolutely charming to me. She congratulated me on my speech, but more importantly, she put me at my ease when she queued up to go into the uh, council chamber to receive the freedom, and she said to me, doesn't your hair look lovely at the back? Mm -hmm. And that really put my, me at my ease to give her the speech as to why we were confirming, conferring freedom on her. It wasn't because she was the first woman Prime Minister, it was because it was the first time my borough had ever had a Member of Parliament as Prime Minister. And this historic occasion um, had a Jewish interest for me as well, because I was able to tell her that the very first time I had met her personally was when I had initiated a group for the Friends of the Hebrew University to get scholarships for girls to go to the Scopus University in Israel, and I had invited her to be the first speaker. That was exactly 20 years ago after the June 67 war. Yesterday we should have we celebrated 20 years of this group and she talked about how important it was for girls to have education. She was particularly uh, uh, praiseworthy about the wonderful educational opportunities in Israel and how she knew people in Israel who were lecturing there and what a high standard there was there. That was the first time I met her. I was to meet her many times and to chair many meetings for her after that. And always she talked about Israel, she talked about what a pity it was, the Alon plan wasn't implemented. She obviously had many friends in Israel, although she couldn't always express her uh, interest in Israel, as she has been able to do more recently since she's visited Israel, formally as Prime Minister. 
and as in the last couple of days she's received Mr. Perry here and hoping to put forward uh, a peace settlement. So it was a very interesting year as Mayor of Barnet, particularly to see uh, the voluntary organisations doing their work in the borough. I took great pride in the fact that apart from setting up the CAB in Hendon, I was able to start the first volunteer bureau for the borough of Barnet, which has been greatly successful, first in Finchley, and that I got a grant from the council for it, it's now become part of the scene. I was also very happy that uh, the other night I attended the annual meeting of the Voluntary Services Council of Barnet, and although I'm no longer in the area, I also take pleasure in the fact that the voluntary organisations now have this umbrella body and that it's a delight that although the Jewish population of Barnet are only 25%, the voluntary workers in Barnet are so often Jewish and work together with a general population for the good of everybody. And now I see that they are, quite rightly, showing the newer immigrants what uh, how, how well the, the Jewish community was able to integrate in the past. I suppose um, serving on education bodies widened my horizons. I was chairman of schools, many schools, served on North London Collegiate School, which my daughter attended and which my granddaughter is now attending. And uh, the, the uh, value of governors up to now has been very limited in the education field, but I now see that they're going to take a larger role and I'm pleased about that. I think some of the local authority schools are excellent. Unfortunately, it depends in which area you live and how, the, how good the head teachers are. In 1983, uh, 84, we moved, we moved here, we moved to Northwood. And we then severed our connection with the Mill Hill community and the Mill Hill United Synagogue. And uh, we transferred our membership to the Pinner United Synagogue, where my daughter uh, and her family, the Dysons, were members. And um, my daughter knew we had many Jewish books to give away, and she said, why don't you get in touch with a charming Rabbi Goldstein he will, will collect your books, I think, for the library. And this, Andrew Goldstein did. And since when we also do join the community, and we've never been happier in any community, and we are full of admiration for the teamwork and the splendid human contacts we've made through. Rita, well, we're going to start interviewing again, and we had quite um, an interval since we last met, so I thought it would be, uh, you, you might find that you'd like to recap on one or two things. We ended up last time on your arrival at Northwood, um, however, since you've, we've had a lapse of time, I wonder if there were one or two interesting things you might like to tell us about your time when you were in Barnet and your other involvements. Well, I'd like to do that very much. Thank you for the opportunity. I really ought to go back to when I was on the GRC and joined their housing committee. And then towards my end of, end of my short stay on the GRC, which was on 73, um, I was asked if I would join as a trustee of the Ada Lewis Housing Trust for Women. I was particularly anxious, interested rather, in doing this because Ada Lewis had left her money at the beginning of the century for housing for working women in London and the then LCC had power to nominate to the trusteeship. Uh, I continued as a trustee of Ada Lewis uh, until after I came to Northward and came, became chairman for a while. Um, Ada Lewis was the widow of Samuel Lewis. Samuel Lewis was very well known in the uh, housing world. He was a jeweller, a manufacturing jeweller from Birmingham. They had no children. And he left his money for family housing in London. And even today there are a lot of um, Samuel Lewis Trust houses and flats in North London. And they are extending their 
a number of units with the help of the housing corporation to places all over the south of England. Ada Lewis, on the other hand, left her money for hostels for working women in London. She realized at that time the only way a girl could come to London to have a, 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 any, a, any independence was to be a governess or to be a domestic. There were other opportunities if she had housing, if the girl had housing. So Ada Lewis's investment was in a, a hostel in the New Kent Road where there was a warden and where recently I had the opportunity of meeting uh, one of the original residents of this hostel uh, who was there until no, not original residents, but one of the residents of this hostel who was there in the 30s. In fact, a sister-in-law of Frank Gibson, you may know who Frank Gibson is. Mm, yeah, do. Anyway, she lived in the hostel and she told me what, how wonderful it was uh, to have this independence. At that time, she was getting all her meals provided, communal lounges and sharing bedrooms. By the time I left it as chairman, all the girls had their individual bedrooms and the uh, communal accommodation, the communal lounges, although they were there, um, a difference was being made with communal eating and the dining rooms were being turned into more bed sitters. It would have been impossible without money from the housing corporation and from uh, uh, the ho housing association grants uh, to carried on this work. Charity money alone, unfortunately, no longer finances just this. But, but with a partnership between the charity money and the housing and the government housing corporation grants, it was possible to enlarge the number of hostels we had. And so we had a hostel in West Kensington, a hostel in um, uh, Holloway Road, and a new one when we took over Beatrice Court in Wembley, now called the Ada Lewis House. Uh, one of the innovations I was pleased to be able to make was to provide housing for the disabled. In other words, for women who were in wheelchairs but yet could go out to work, uh, to have suitably uh, uh, adapted accommodation with uh, the plugs and the taps all at the right height. And this uh, has proved a boon to uh, uh, most of the people who've been lucky enough to be allocated flats in these developments. I was very glad that a Jewish woman had started this, although of course the accommodation is for uh, anybody eligible uh, because they're on low, lower incomes and or because they, uh, they have special needs. When I was on Barnet Council I was uh, for a while a vice chairman of the housing committee before I became mayor and there again it was uh, very uh, satisfying to be able to see that uh, the Barnet Council should support housing associations and should also give opportunities for disabled people to live in suitable accommodation. Usually I preferred it to be mixed with other people so that not all people are the same with, with disabilities just live together just as I don't really believe that all the elderly should just live together. These were some of the ideas I was able to introduce. It was also an opportunity for me to further the work of housing associations in Barnet, which I very much approved of, but some of my fellow councillors didn't. And I, they uh, were not encouraging to me, either in giving financial grants or in cooperating. But the officers were. And the officers of Barnet Council, the housing officers, were particularly praiseworthy of the work done by certain Jewish housing associations in Barnet. There was the B'nai Brit, which opened Harmony Close, and I believe has been a very harmonious development ever since in Princess Park Avenue in Golders Green. There was a B'nai Brit house called Daniel Court in Graham Park, which is, has been built on the old Hendon Aerodrome in Collindale. And uh, there were new housing associations, buildings by Jewish housing associations in Stone Grove. And of course, there was a lot of development by Hammersons in Bishop's Avenue homes, by the Westlawn Housing Association, which is ongoing. And through uh, 
of my connections, I was able to suggest the starting of a Barnet Housing Association group where housing associations of different denominations of different purposes were able to meet together under the chairmanship of Alan Silverman of the West London Housing Association, the West London being the West London Synagogue Housing Association originally, but that grew. And under his chairmanship, they cooperated together to see if they could share coaches, share facilities, and above all, share ideas on how to make life better for more independent living in a housing association. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> yeah, that really was. So what, what else do you well things? Yes, perhaps I ought to tell you about uh, a couple of rare experiences. It was my uh, good fortune to have. And one was that soon after I came on the council, Norman Hirschfield was mayor, Jewish mayor who lived in Hendon and had his civic service at Raleigh Close. And he was very keen to have a twinning with a uh, city in Israel. He knew that Barnet had been twinned with uh, places in Germany, Finchley had been twinned um, with places in France and in Germany, and so the new borough of Barnet, he felt, because it had 25% of Jewish um, population, it was very suitable to have a link with Israel, and Norman Hirschfield toured Israel to find the right one, and he found that Ramat Gaon would suit very well, and so Ramat Gaon became twinned with Barnet, and I was the first honorary secretary of the Friends of Ramat Gan in Barnet. Uh, before I became mayor, I went with my husband uh, on a private visit to Ramat Gan, where I was very impressed with uh, the, the, the setup there. Of course, mayors in Ramat Gan in Israel are very different. They are really like our chief executives here. But um, I was glad to um, see their museum, see how how Norman Hirschfeld was quite right and the sort of life that people would lead in Ramat Gan was not so very different from what people were leading in Barnet. But it was a great thrill when I was able to return the hospitality of Ramat Gan officially this time and have the mayor of Ramat Gan, Dr. Peled, come to visit Barnet during my year of office. Dr. Peled came with his deputation from uh, uh, Ramat Gan and we had an official reception for them at the town hall. I remember uh, Nicholas Bethel was present for his interest in Israel, and the members of parliament were present. And during the time of their visit, it was very fortunate Bobby, my husband, had an invitation by the new Lord Mayor of London to um, uh, Sir Peter, I can't think of his other name for the moment, I think of the moment, Sir Peter, to um, visit the crypt of the Guildhall to the Coleman Street Ward Club. It was a custom that the new Lord Mayor of London goes every year as uh, one of his early visits to the Coleman Street Ward Club. So, on this occasion, I invited the Mayor of Ramat Gunn and his party, the Chief Executive of Barnet, um, Mr. Bennett, and several of the Chairman of the uh, Committees of Barnet. We went to the crypt of the Guildhall. And imagine my delight when I found Lady Donaldson, who was then the, the president of Coleman Street Ward Club because she'd been their alderman, saying to me, do wait here, Rita, because the Lord Mayor wants to be introduced to the Mayor of Ramat Gun before he starts his official visit. And so the two mayors met, the one from the new town of Ramat Gun, comparatively new, and the other from the ancient city of London. Well, during the Lord Mayor's speech, he welcomed the Mayor of Ramat Gan and his party, and he said, you know, we have our own Jewish settlement in the city. We've recently been doing a dig, and we have discovered archaeological remains of the early, real old Jew Jewish settlement here. And so we're very pleased to have this continuation of the links between our two countries. And that was a very pleasant civic mm. occasion, and the Ramat Gan people particularly appreciated. Mm. I can't think of the name. Yes, um, I think you mentioned to me once that you had rather an interesting story to tell us about Westminster Abbey. So, um, you know, perhaps you'd like to yes. record it for yes. posterity. <laughs> well, the custom 
is for Westminster Abbey to invite the new mayors of London to a special service at the Abbey on a Sunday morning. Um, the mayors and the mayor's attendants, their um, mace bearers, assembled in the crypt of the Abbey for the Sunday morning service and we were being robed, that means putting on these medieval red robes with the chains of office and suddenly the man who was organising the event, who was in fact the chief executive of Westminster, said, will the Mayor of Barnet please come forward, will he come over here? And she proceeded and said, yes. And he said, you are going to lead the procession into Westminster Abbey. And I said, why is Barnet so honoured? And he said, because it's done alphabetically That's what and <laughs> Barking didn't turn up. But I paused for a moment to... and I thought, what would my Jewish Jews College trained father have thought of me leading the service on a Sunday morning into Westminster Abbey? Would he have been against it, queried it? But my father was a very tolerant man. And then I remembered he had worked for a firm called Rafe of Tux, Dick Cohen's connection. I knew Dick Cohen's grandfather, Gustav Tark, who Rafe of Tux, but this is a side. But my father had suggested to Rafe of Tux that they could, should publish a series of books on the cathedrals of England and that uh, they could then sell it for the benefit of the cathedral, for the friends of the cathedral, but, and of course for Rafe of Tux. And this was done. And he made friends with the Dean of Westminster Abbey and Mr. Tanner at Westminster Abbey, and he was invited to various cathedrals and abbeys throughout the country. He was a lifelong vegetarian, my father, and he would have lunch with these people, and they would discuss uh, divinity, which he knew very well and could exchange stories with them. But Westminster Abbey, this was a great honour. I led the procession, and, and, and I was also very happy to see in the procession afterwards Rabbi Jackie Tarbett, representing the yeah. liberal synagogue, the reform, the reform yes, synagogue, yes. and here was a woman rabbi yeah. coming into the procession. Yeah. So that was quite an occasion for me, and uh, we were very warmly welcomed by the dean. I met the dean on another occasion, Dean Carpenter. Uh, the headmistress of North London Collegiate School was retiring. I was a governor of North London Collegiate, and the Dean invited the governors to uh, a farewell party for Miss McLaughlin in the Jerusalem chamber of Westminster Abbey. And this too was very strange that I as a Jewess should be invited to the Jerusalem chamber about which I'd heard so much. And it was a very friendly occasion. And I knew, I knew Canon Carpenter the Dean, because he had been the chairman of the governors of the Francis Mary Bus, North London Collegiate, he once or twice presided over meetings when I was there. And I said to the Dean that I'd heard a lot about what he'd been doing recently for the Council of Christians and Jews. And he said, yes, we had a meeting here today. Your people are very worried, just as I am. So I said, do you mean about this missionary work that's being done? He said, that's right. I said, in Edgware, he said, yes, they're very worried they've been approaching me about it. He said, of course, we can't help this fundamentalism any more than you can help it. And uh, this seemed to me a very telling comment. He went on to say, it would be wrong to say that we don't believe in trying to be mission in being missionaries, we do in certain circumstances, but not in the way it's being done in Edgware. And I said, by the Reverend Gordon Bennett? And he said, that's right, don't approve of that at all. So mm. I think that is worth recording. He mm. has since retired, Dr. Carpenter, but um, retired from the Abbey, but not in his continued interest in the Council of Christians and Jews. And um, it is interesting uh, that the, one of the present uh, active people in the Council of Christians and Jews is Dr. Colgan, who took a great interest in John Groom's Association of the Disabled. And John Groom's was my charity when I was mayor. And I met Dr. Colgan at John Groom's. And uh, it all seemed to 
tie up very much with the good relationship I have found between the educated Christians and the educated Jews in trying to work together for a common purpose. So, I don't know the most interesting talk you've given us, uh, Rita. In fact, I've really hardly used, been able to use my uh, notes that I was was given uh, t as, a, as an interviewer because you have such a fund of knowledge and a, f a full flow, if I may say so. <laughs> Too much. No, 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 no. It's most interesting. So let's sort of just move um, to, to sort of conclude our, our chat today. Um, why you particularly moved to Northwood and uh, why you joined our synagogue. Um, I think that would be quite interesting for us to know. Uh, I believe you have uh, also uh, an affiliation with the Pinner United Synagogue, so perhaps you'd like to tell us. Yes. We moved to Northwood because our daughter lived in Northwood and was very happy with her husband, John Dyson, and her children living in Northwood. And I felt the need to move from a house to a smaller place because we were getting on and not as capable as we were before with the garden and the house. Um, we transferred our membership from Mill Hill United Synagogue to Pinner United Synagogue. Uh, our uh, daughter and son-in-law belonged there and it was the obvious thing to do as a, as a transfer. When we came to live in this flat in the Eastbury Avenue, um, I discussed with my daughter some Jewish books I had to give away and we had l hundreds of books and many of Jewish interest, and she said, why don't you give them to the Northwood Liberal Synagogue? They're setting up a library, and I'm sure they'd be pleased to have them. They said, there's a very nice rabbi. I know his wife, Sharon. Uh, why don't you phone him and see what he says? So I phoned the rabbi, and Rabbi Goldstein came around very quickly, collected the books, which are now in the library, including, I think, an Encyclopedia Britannica, not just of Jewish interest, and I decide, he said to me then, I know you don't belong to our synagogue, but if at any time you'd like to come, please be free to do so. So I took him up on that. It was a pleasure to be able to walk to the synagogue rather than oh. ride. And uh, I enjoyed the services. I particularly enjoyed the fact that I could understand what it was all about. Sedra, the Torah was explained to me in simple language. I could come back and look it up and understand it very much better than I ever have before. And after a while, I persuaded my husband that he might like to attend a service one Shabbos morning, which he did. And he said, yes, I agree with you. This is a very nice synagogue. And he said, why don't we join? And I said, join? We already belong to a synagogue. He said, well, let's go into it. It can't be so terribly expensive. Were we in our new building? Yes, mm. you were in your new, uh, new building. We mm. moved here in 83. Mm. Mm. And... Um, so I said, you really mean it? He said, yes. Well, I saw that uh, Sus um, Hill, Adrian, um, what's her name? Barbara Hill. Barbara Hill, Barbara Hill um, was in charge of membership at the time. Mm. And I'd met her in another capacity. And oh. she came around to see us. And we discussed the all important question of burial rights and synagogue fees. And we decided that it was best to leave the burial rites where they were, since we'd paid since the year dot. Mm. And, uh, but nevertheless, we could afford to be members of the synagogue. So this is how it happened. And one of the happiest occasions Bobby and I had was to get to know Andrew better, it was when we went to Prague with him to visit the Jewish community oh, yeah. in Czechoslovakia. And we were amazed at how unaffected he is by being in such an exalted position and it's mm -hmm. quite obvious to us that Andrew and Sharon have done a tremendous amount in making the community feel it can live and extend its Judaism without uh, going backwards, the community is going forwards and uh, although we belong to the United Synagogue still, um, we feel that uh, the liberal has a much more uh, sensible approach to today's problems in Judaism. We yes. don't like the idea of going further to the right as well. uh, many former members of the United Synagogue or many present members of the United Synagogue are. There seem to be no middle ground. Well. So.
No, that's very interesting. I'm glad you like it here, and you've been able to contribute <laughs> a again by, by uh, you know, taking part in this interview, which um, is an asset for us, and I think this will go down as one of our uh, most, most interesting interviews. So I'd I'm just like to tell yeah. you one or two other things I've yes, been able certainly. to do here, and that is I've always been interested um, in the Hebrew University because yeah. I remember I grew up with a Pilakowski painting of Lord Balfour laying the foundation yeah. stone and uh, I knew Dr. Weizmann uh, personally and many of the people involved in wanting a university. But um, whereas when we st I started a group, when I told you that I'd invited Mrs. Thatcher to address uh, providing scholarships for girls at the Hebrew University, that was in 67 when we started it. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, yes, that was in 67. Um, we just had our 20th anniversary celebration of yeah. that group, now called the Scopus Group. It was the North West London Women's Group. Um, after finding that I could no longer be... I was chairman for many years, but after finding I could no longer be chairman because I was involved in other things, I uh, have maintained my interest. And from home, from this little flat, I was convinced we ought to do something to help particularly Jewish children who suffer from diabetes. And I launched a campaign from home to help them do research into diabetes research in children at the Hadassah Medical School, which is part of the Hebrew University. And this has raised a lot of money, so far 13,000 pounds, for providing an extra researcher at the Scopus University. You're never idle for a minute, are you? <laughs> I know you've done work with the NSPCC in this area as well. Perhaps you'd like to tell us a little bit about that. Well, the NSPCC has been going for a hundred years, and I can't say that I've been associated with it no. for very long. But when we were having their centenary year, I was approached to see if I could help with a campaign in northwest London. And um, I'm afraid I rather... I was very naughty. I suggested that their target ought to be a quarter of a million pounds. But of course, having said this at the inaugural meeting, somebody said, well, you raise the money. <laughs> and uh, I set about trying to do that with a large committee. But when we came to live here in the middle of that centenary appeal, I realized that our remit for Northwest London involved Northward, Harrow, and we hadn't really, there'd been no real efforts here. So with the help of a few people, we managed to set up a small committee which raised about £48,000 in the six months left to us of the centenary appeal. And through that committee, um, I met Nan Rees, and who suggested to me June Samuel, mm -hmm. and I found that they were both members mm -hmm. of the Northwood Liberal, Liberal mm -hmm. Synagogue. Through that, uh, because of that committee, I met some very interesting non-Jewish people who were working at Pocklington, where I'd started to work through the League of Jewish Women. And uh, so we had Miss Basden, Eileen Basden on, and the Metherals on, and, and Andrew Pears, my old colleague from Barnet, um, was very much involved in this committee with us. And there again, um, it, it was very worthwhile work. And as you see, it still goes on. And unfortunately, I have to say it, Jewish children are also involved. And I'm glad sure. that not only the NSPCC, but also Nor Norwood Child Care are also trying mm. to do something to educate parents mm. so that children don't continue to suffer. Mm. So is that all you want for the NSPCC? Well, it's also so many, so many very interesting things. What else have we got lined up? What else have I got lined up? up? I mean, you do voluntary. You do your voluntary work at, at Parklington. Yes, I I do. I've given up all my school governorships. I've oh. given up all my vice presidencies of umpteen things. Yeah. And uh, I find now that it is nice to do this direct uh, work at Parklington, where I run a discussion circle. I can't push trolleys. I admire what the League of um, Jewish Women does locally. I was a chairman, I think, in the forties. And I um, think, it, think it's wonderful the way the League works for non-Jewish causes, non-Jewish um, voluntary efforts. Mm. And it was with great joy that I was once able 
to introduce some League members at a crossroads meeting when I got Mrs Thatcher to address it just before the 1983 election. I chaired this meeting at the Annette White Lodge and I introduced her to everybody present. It was just the Friday before she called the 83 election. And I said to her, this is Mrs. Valerie Hyams of the League of Jewish Women, and this is Mrs. Lily Rose of the League of Jewish Women. Mm -hmm. She said, the League of Jewish Women, wherever I go in the voluntary sphere, they do marvellous work, the League of Jewish Women. And she knew a lot about them. That's so, good, yeah. it, you know, it really is amazing how this organisation, which is non-fundraising, uh, does so much. And of course, when I came to Northwood, it was a joy to see that the Northwood people are now involved nationally in the League. I don't want to mention names because there are yeah. so many of them, but uh, they've progressed from the Northwood League, the headquarters, and they're doing a terrific mm. job. Mm. And I'm glad that June Samuel, who's now mm. interviewing me, actually mm. got to the International Council of Women in Conference, in Canada, yes. Yeah. Where, where um, uh, the League had, had a large part to play. That's right. So. Okay, Rita, thank you very much. And a little later date, I'm going to have an interview uh, with Bobby because I think it's a uh, two make a partnership and it would be very uh, a, a, a one sided partnership if I only spoke to you so I'm going to fix another date with Bobby I hope you do and I hope he tells you how proud of he is of, of our, you our children. <laughs> no, of, of our your children, children yes as well <laughs> of all of you okay thank you very much